Ladies and gentlemen, up until now you've seen the creature perform the simple mechanics of motor activity, but for what you are about to see next, we must enter quietly into the realm of genius. genius. Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, Damen und Herren, from what was once an inarticulate mass of lifeless tissues, may I now present a cultured, sophisticated man about town. Hey! The, the, the Sketchomatic Show. Thrilling to be back. I am majorly excited for this episode of the Sketcho Show podcast. Sketchy, sketchy. It's finally here. I've reached the top. Yeah. In other words, I've reached the peak. I got to walk my man up. My special guest today has been in the radio game for decades. He is the program director of 1043 My FM in Los Angeles at iHeartMedia and was also, I would say, somewhat recently, since 2020, took over the vice president of programming wow. of iHeartMedia Los Angeles, and I'm sure some other markets as well, which we can get into, right? Just Los Angeles. All right. I still have to walk you up. So here we go. Uh, after a massively persistent sketch your boy here finally got this special guest in studio, which is a rare event. It's like seeing a comet to get this man in and to spare us an hour on my little old podcast. sketch o So let's get right into it. Let's get inside the mind of program director, vice president of iHeartMedia Los Angeles, the one and only John Peak. John Peak, how are you, sir? That was quite an introduction. Thank you. I'm doing great. That's wonderful. I'm so excited and and slightly anxious to talk to you in person in a face-to-face interview like this. Oh, I feel I mean, the same way. Are you? I'm, yeah. I mean, well, you're looking at this this mug of mine. It, it, it terrifies everybody. It's a good <laughs> thing we're only in audio. Um, but John Peake, there's so much to get to. We were just talking off podcast air about just about the podcast, you know, you know what I talk about. It's a, it's a radio podcast. It's a DJ podcast, entertainment, comedy. And then we started going into you Working up in the Bay, right? San Francisco. Correct. Is that where you're originally from? No, no. Originally from Washington, D.C. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got to get into that, too, because I got so many questions for you. But at the same time, this podcast is also just a conversation and, and you know, some deep thought. But John Peake was telling me uh, that you had met Robin Williams at the state. What station was it in the Bay? I was uh, Alice. Right. Uh, and uh, Robin, uh, if you don't know, uh, was a, a fixture in the, in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, he had a pretty high profile there. He was fearless about uh, going out and, and, and being seen. Um, and we'd see him often at, at, at shows. You know, he'd be at shows. He was a music fan. Right. And when Robin was testing out new material, there was, a, there was a club in the Bay Area called Bimbo's. Mm. And uh, he would call them, you know, Friday morning and say, I'm doing three shows this weekend. Uh-huh. put them on sale and you know the folks from bimbos would call us and go hey robin williams is doing material this weekend we're putting shows on sale uh so with you know just a few hours notice he would sell out for the entire weekend and you'd go to those shows and he'd be testing out all the new material the show maybe two hours two and a half hours wow uh and he would be you know trying out new stuff and even during the act he'd go well that didn't work or that did so he'd be making notes throughout and then once he'd refine that act, that's what he'd take on the road as a material. So wow. you got to see it in it in its rawest form, yeah. uh, and you got to see it coming together. And if you went to the show on Friday, it'd be different than the show that he uh, performed on Sunday. Uh, uh, he was a, a great citizen of the Bay Area, yeah. a, a good man, and uh, and he's missed. And people are going to know, Robin, how do I know uh, if I'm an alcoholic? Well, as one, let me give you some warning signs. <laughs> Number one, after a night of heavy drinking, you wake up fully clothed going, hey! Somebody's shit in my pants. John Peake, that's an incredible, like, first story. I mean, you, so what, was this in the 90s or was it 80s still? Oh, that was, uh, that was in the, well into the 2000s. Oh, so, this was, yeah. oh, this yeah. millennium. Yeah. Wow. Sure, okay, because, you sure. know, he's been, he was killing it for, also for decades. For decades. For and, decades. And there's so much that, I mean, I imagine the knowledge we can, uh, we could learn from him if he was still here. And that really bums me out about a lot of, People who pass celebrities, artists, when they pass too soon or just, you know, tragically, as, as Robin did, obviously committed suicide. But 
It was under for the reasons he had might he probably had Parkinson's or something like yeah, that, right? Yeah. Them. So he kind of you know he checked himself out early. Yeah. However, I just think about like Tupac, Biggie, Nipsey, Kobe. Yeah. You know, obviously some of these guys are well. There are all the other ones I just stated were very young, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm like, man, if Tupac, for example, was still here today, I don't know how old he'd be exactly, but just imagine the knowledge. Incredible, right? Right. Yeah. And that's what I want to get into. Too with you, uh, John Peake. I mean, there's so much knowledge you can share about the positions you hold. I always refer to you as, uh, well, I say, oh, I'm going to check in with Peak about it. You know, dad. <laughs> oh, dad. Yeah, he's everybody's <laughs> dad, right? You're, the, you're everybody's dad on the programming side. Let me ask you this, John Peak. Um, since you're vice president, and and is there who is president? Who's the is it is it Bob Pittman? Is it Ashlock? Who's the above at the president level? Because I looked on the emails and I try to find a president's signature other than Legrette, who's a president of marketing. Yes. But that's a different type of president, yes. right? There is. Who, who, who's the president of a program? So it, uh, that's uh, Tom Pullman. Uh, oh, Pullman, right? Uh, Tom yes. Pullman is our chief programming officer for for all of iHeart. So. Um, all of our content mm-hmm. uh, is what falls under his purview. I see. So I see. And whether and that that could be digital content, anything you hear online, and it's our broadcast content as well. Interesting, John. I mean, because it's so fascinating the chain of command within iHeartMedia that a lot of people don't quite to uh, get to see behind the curtain, and especially somebody like you, John, who's a very high up now. Now, this is one of my first questions I want to get into regarding the position of iHeartMedia and, and be, being becoming the VP and during the pandemic, yeah. no less, right? Mm-hmm. I remember getting the email that was Andrew Jeffries, who was, your form, who was formerly the, P, uh, the VP of iHeartMedia, who hired me, as a matter of fact. And I mean, he's like, you hired, mate. I remember <laughs> he, he hired me on the spot. Even Tony Sanchez, his, his eyes almost popped out of his head. He was like, wait, I've never really seen him do that, to well, be honest. He, yeah, so people were campaigning. Obviously, I had people like Big Boy... Uh, Jill Deegan, other people, the other players behind the scenes that were really campaigning, even Doc Winter put in a good word. And when I got hired by Jeffries, it seemed like short lived that I got to work with him or work alongside him. You know, he was a very f- funny guy. I love from New Zealand. And he'd always be like, uh, what's up, Sketch? You know, you can turn up the lights in here. And because and, and, I always have them dim. And he'd walk in, he'd go, these go higher. And then he'd walk out, out with the, the, the lights, the track lights fully bright. And I'd go and turn them back down. It sounds and, like it sounds yeah. like Andrew Jeffries. And then and go, you, your yeah. impersonation is pretty good. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I always say, I now come up to you, I say, uh, Andrew, can you do an American accent? And you go, uh, no, not really, mate. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, there's got to be a word like like how we say like a lot in 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 L. A. You know, like have you been to the beach? John's going to be like on my podcast. Yeah. Um, and he goes, no, it's not really like, mate. It's more of a. He goes garage. And I was like, whoa. And he goes, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's garage. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, no, no, it's garage. He's like, no, no, gar- garage. It's g- do it again. He goes, garage. <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, all right, that's enough American accents. Get back to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Turn the lights up. Yeah. But okay. So getting the, the VP position, is this something that you're, in other words, groomed for? And I don't mean in the weird, you know, sexual no. way. I mean, in the, you know how they groom for pres, they groom presidents to become presidents. Okay. Now, you're a vice president. How do you become the vice president? Do you apply? Like, do you ask to be? Or do they just kind of nominate you based on your experience? I think it's the kind of thing that probably uh, uh, goes both ways. The company is able to identify those people that may be good for these positions, right? They're coming along. And also, you make make your interest clear. Like, hey, I'd like that job. Mm-hmm. I wanna, I'd want i like to do that job. What can I do now that will prepare me for that position? So right. it, it, it's sort of a, a joint effort, I would say. Right. So you wanted to be VP. Yes. You felt like it was yeah. like you earned it. You've definitely put in an enormous amount of hours being what? a program director. And then before that, you, you how did you start? But go ahead. Where are you going to finish? I think that, uh, you know, for this similar position, I held this position in uh, Seattle. I held this position in San Diego. So I had some experience that translated Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Los Angeles, as we all know, is a much bigger stage and a far larger platform. Oh, yeah. uh, however, all that experience really mattered and, and prepared me for this. That's interesting. Yep. How the evolution of, of your career has unfolded. Did you ever think you were going to be VP of uh, iHeart Media Los Angeles? No, never. Never. Right. No, no. I mean, because you're originally from D.C., right? Originally from D.C., right? right? And that's where you, you started in radio. How did you start? How did you get into radio? Um, I guess we all have our own unique story yeah. of how, yeah. how, how it happened. And uh, I think that my interest in radio started 
early, early. Uh, I can remember, you know, in in junior high and, you know, doing my homework in my room and, and listening to the radio uh, and having some of my favorite DJs on. And, and uh, particularly with the evening shows, I would started by calling in song requests, like so many of us, right? You started as a listener. Uh, yeah, right. and uh, then occasionally uh, I would get on the radio because, you know, the whoever the right. DJ is would tape me and put me in the radio. Right, which uh, is awesome, by the way, hearing yourself oh, back so on fun. the air. Yeah. How old were you? Well, what time, what, what, teenager? Four, 14, you know, wow. 15. And then, uh, and then I realized that if I called in with uh, some content, if I called in with a bit, if I called in with an idea just beyond the song request, I'd probably get on the air. So you were starting to write material. Yeah, so, I'm, I, you know, I, during my school day, oh, if I call in with this thing tonight, you know, I could get on the air. And I figured out, oh, well, the better it was and the more clever it was, the more interesting it was, the more local it was, the more likely I was to hopefully be on on the radio that night. It was super fun. So I'd sit in my room, come up with stuff and occasionally get on the air, occasionally not. And that was when I first started, you know, interacting on the phones at least. Right. Uh, with, with the DJs. And, and as you know, uh, you know, the experience of recording your phone call and then, Hearing on the air is very different. Like, oh yeah, uh, and I also learned that I had to be quick. I had to get to the point. Uh, I could, I learned how mean some of the DJs. Oh could yeah, be. They especially had, back then. Especially there was no back, rules. Yeah, yeah. No, really, there was no getting point. canceled. No getting. Canceled. <laughs> but that didn't that didn't stop you. You know, right. you you still sort of push through it. And, right. Uh, uh, and that's how it, you know I, I got first you know bit by the bug of right. doing that, and then right. Uh, really close to my high school, there was a small AM radio station, WDON, in Wheaton, Maryland, mm. uh, and uh, they were looking for somebody to answer the phones. We're the difference. And I saw the on the bulletin board at school a job posting, so I went over and said, hey, "I could do this, you know, and just put right. me in here." And uh, and uh, they needed somebody, and apparently no one else was interested. So uh, so I was hired, and that's how I started, uh, just by answering the phones. And and I think because I showed up every day on time, I was like, "Oh, this guy, you know, he's he's showing up. He's, he's the real deal. He's the real. He actually is on time for the job." And I remember. Uh, uh, they, in a way to save money, they were like, hey, they fired the cleaning crew. And uh, they say, hey, at the end of the day, when you're done answering the phones, can you just, you know, vacuum and empty the trash? I'm like, of course. Wow. It's the greatest job in the world. I get to work in a radio station. So I answer the phones, empty the trash. And, and then um, I was asked, hey, on the weekends, we need someone to come in and uh, be a board operator. Watch the technical ex you know, watch the technical operation. If you could make sure that the transmitter stays on the air and, you know, the audio gets on the air, if you could do that, that's great. So uh, I'm like, what time? Like, I'll just be here Sunday morning at 6 a.m. I'm like, Great. Yeah, I did that. You, you did it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I just show up every Sunday morning at 6 a.m. Yeah. And uh, and then- it's like church. Uh, like church. <laughs> and, and we, you know, the, during that period, we had some 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 uh, preacher programs mm -hmm, and whatnot mm -hmm. on the air, but, uh, 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 and that's how sort of it all started. It was super fun. And I look back at that, I'm like, that was- uh, I still look back. It was a great job. You know, I get paid Man. minimum wage. And, yeah. But it was fantastic. I know. It's the dream and following that intuition of like, I feel like this is calling to me. That's yes. what it was for me too, yep. getting into radio. But really, I followed in Big Boy's footsteps. Yep. I started as a DJ when I was 12 years old. Right. And I met Big Boy when I was 12 years old. And I've talked about this on this podcast. I had him on this podcast early on, episode 10. This is going to be episode, this is episode 28. It's great. And real quick sidebar. Uh, I was talking to some of the fine folks here in the hallway that answer the phone. Speaking of answering the phones, mm -hmm. Roger, Rodri uh, Roger Rodriguez, a.k.a. Roger Rabbit. Right? <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, I'm going to have John Peake on the show. And he's like, wow, really? I'm like, I know, a rare event. <laughs> and he goes, after this, you can just call it quit, Sketch. And no, was, <laughs> I said, I said, I know, I feel like this is it. This is going to be the last episode, John Peake. Or we're going to destroy the whole thing right. today. Right? Or no, no. And he, <laughs> well... No, that if anybody destroys it, it'll be me, but not you. And then he goes, he goes, uh, you can stop after this because you've reached the peak. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'll be here till you fire me, John Peak. Um, but yeah, getting back to your just real quick, your first idea. Do you remember any of your ideas that you you called into the show about or to your oh, radio station? Goodness, was it W D O N? No. Uh, well, W D O N was where I was uh, working. Right. Prior to that, I was listening to uh, a legendary Washington D.C. radio station uh, called W P G C. Music radio. 
WPGC. And uh, there's probably some people in this building that have worked there at one point or another. So it's uh, it's one of these. And now their boss is here. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And it's one of these legendary pop stations yeah. in the in the Washington D.C. market. And one of our employees uh, who now works for us in Washington D.C. hosting a morning show. His name is Don Geronimo. Oh. And uh, he's sort of legendary in our business, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And Don Geronimo was this uh, remarkable night host. Ah. Uh, and one of those guys that had a lot of phone calls and talked fast. And, yeah, he uh, was like, uh, everybody coming at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. WPGC 603. This is Don Geronimo. Ooh, I love the saxophone in that song. Love that sax. All we need is some violins now. We could have sax and violins, just like the news on TV now. Don't go. And uh, so uh, uh, Don Geronimo was the guy that uh, I would call with my with my ideas. I, uh, God forbid, I remember one or two of them, but that was uh, that was. But the you guy. don't remember any of the no. ideas? No, 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 not even like an angle. No, 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 no. I don't remember. Them. Okay, that's cool. No, but what about? Uh, did you? Okay, so it seems like you just kind of got in because you're really good at writing these bits or these yep. segments of content yep. that you can call in about whatever was happening around you. I'm sure you figured it out. But did you ever go to school? Other than getting hired and throwing out the trash and, and, and running the board on Sunday mornings for the, like the preacher programs and whatnot. But is that how you learned? You never went to, there was, was there school for broadcast? I mean, it was a little bit more strict back then with the FCC and the, who's running the board. You have to add an FCC license, license. or stuff like that. Did you have to go uh, through all that? I, I do have an FCC license. Look at and you. That's good. Yes, I do. I don't so have many licenses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were more stringent requirements back, uh, back during that time. That, that has since been relaxed. Mm -hmm. We still have the same technical obligations, but the requirement to have a license has, has changed quite a right, bit. Yeah, it no yeah. longer exists. More relaxed. Um, yeah. And, I uh, went to the University of Maryland, mm. so uh, that's right there in the Washington, D.C. area. So while I was working at these radio stations, I was also going to school. And uh, we had a campus radio station, mm -hmm. uh, WMUC, uh, uh, stands for University of Maryland, and I worked at the campus station. And there I was the program director, and there I was on the air. So I was continuing to get this experience while I was in school. And then uh, there's a, a another pop station, which is no longer in existence mm. uh, in D.C. called Q107. And it was another big pop radio station. It's and like Kiss FM out Yeah, there. exactly. Right. Kiss FM. So m what I was doing was I was at the University of Maryland. I'm going to school and I'm working on the air at this station. And I was uh, working on weekends whenever, you know, whenever they needed me. Yeah. So I was doing you whatever shift. a utility player. Yeah, whatever shift was needed, I was on the air. Uh, and I went through a period. We had a country station in the market and a, and a pop station. And I would work seven to midnight at the country station and then go to the pop station and sleep on the couch for a few hours and then work two to 6 a.m. and then just do four shift over the weekend. And it was, it was, it was great. You were I pulling to, like Ryan Seacrest well, moves, man. But it was, yeah. it was great. I got to be on the radio. I got to do what I loved. I got to be around talent. I got to be around creatives, Yeah, you know? So I, I learned a work ethic, Yeah, right? And like you, I worked Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, you do all of that and what it does is you garner this valuable experience, which which translates later. The uh, amount of hours I've put in, I can't even. I've I try to. I asked Alexa the other day. I said, uh, how, "How many how many hours has it has it been since uh, 1997?" That's when I got into radio. Uh -huh. When I was uh, 18. Oh, well, actually, since I was 16. But I said, "This is brought to the 97." She said over 250,000 hours since then. Oh, that's great. How did you become the program director at the university? Was that your first programming gig? It, it was. Obviously, it was, right. you know, you're a student. It's not a paid position. Yeah. Uh, and we had a board that was made up of... Uh, the you know, pots were like knobs, right? Yeah, the, top, and was, the board was made up of faculty, and yeah. you had to make your proposal to the faculty board. Mm -hmm. And I think every year or every semester, I can't even recall, there was a new program director. Right. Uh, so I applied and... Uh, presented uh my plan and uh and and gotten you know got the got the nod so that's wild and it was almost like it was your first gig yeah. right your first pro pd gig first program but you were on the air before that what was, was your on-air name john peak john peak yep <sighs> It's it already such a cool yeah, name, so American. Yeah, it is very where, American. Where does the peak come from? Peak comes from the father's side of the family is all from uh, from uh, England, Ireland. Ah. 
So it would, particularly with the E on the end makes it yeah, very, yeah. very English. Yes. P-E-A-K-E. E, yeah. I mean, that is, yeah. it sounds cool. Let me say, let me ask you, do you, can, since you come from, or your heritage from like the England is Irish, you said? Or, yes, yes. Right. Can you do any of those accents, John? I cannot. Can you I do cannot. any accents no, at all? Like how I was doing, uh, uh, you know, you were doing that, you're doing Andrew yeah, Jeffries. When he hired yes, me on the yeah. spot and he's like, you're hired, mate. He goes, don't you want to ask me something, mate? And I said, uh, no, no. And he goes. Don't you want to know how much you're going to get paid? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. He's throwing. I was so excited to get the nod from him yes. and to have people campaigning for me. But you do program directing. You, you're you on the air. What are you playing on the air? What are you DJing? Uh, at that time, uh, there was just, you know, it was pop music. Right. Right. Ma Madonna. Uh, Michael Jackson. Or Michael Jackson. Right. Madonna, all of that. And then, obviously, the country station, you know, it was country records I remember my favorite were the Judds wow. you know so we played a lot of a lot so that that was what was happening at the time and also look there were some highly skilled program directors at that pop station Q107 who I worked around and that's where I learned a lot from those guys and right. I have to give those program directors Alan Burns was a program director there Randy Lane was a program director Chuck Morgan uh, these are all names that are sort of known in our business sure. but what they did was they were really generous with their time and when I went to them and had questions, how do you pick these songs to go on the radio? Why do you play this song right. more than another song? How do you decide where the DJs talk? Like they talk at the, you know, the top of the hour, or, uh, 15 minutes past, and how long do they talk? And they would be very generous with their time and, and share that uh, with me. And I appreciate that really helped me uh, learn yeah. Uh, from others kind of like you're being generous and patient with me on this podcast because well, <laughs> let's admit i was literally like you know they say the squeaky wheel doesn't get the oil <laughs> yeah. i mean you could hear me coming from across the freeway <laughs> it just sounded like you know a car with no brake pads <laughs> yeah and it's like uh oh sketch is going to hit me up about the podcast again and then i'll be i'll admit john um when i emailed you i emailed a few other people just to throw out the bait to see who would who would respond right yep. And uh, I hit up JoJo, who agreed, to, who said he would be on it. But I text him. He goes, just text me. Just text me. And I text him, no reply. It's okay. Yep. And I, I, I emailed you. And I go, all right, here goes nothing. He kind of knows what's what's yes. coming. And you responded. Always. And you said Thursday at 5. And I go, oh, my God. <laughs> I was literally moonwalking <laughs> through my apartment. It was wild. Well, I felt so privileged and, and fortunate. Because I got to ask, being the VP of iHeartMedia, which is a massive podcast platform, right? How often do you do podcasts? When was the last time you did a podcast, John? Oh, uh, I can't think of it. Never, you know, yes! never. So this could be my first. <laughs> yes. yeah. This is a Sketchomatic Show podcast. It's <laughs> a first. World premiere. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Oh my God. This is exciting for me, it's John. It's fun. I, I got to admit, yes. And I'm so, I'm, again, I'm so happy you were able to take a chunk out of your busy schedule because I know every time I walk past your office, you have the earpiece in. Oh, you're, right. you're on the phone with somebody. You look like Ari Gold in Entourage, <laughs> but you're not yelling at it. You're one of the most patient people I've met. And I want to get into that too. But how busy you are having to be essentially the programming director dad here, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, over five FM radio stations. Mm -hmm. KISS FM, Real 92.3, Coast 103.5, KYSR, which is Alt 98.7, yep. and you're the program director of 104.3 My FM in Los Angeles. How do you deal with the, the stress of that is constantly being hurled at you at top speed? That's a really good question. Finally, uh, that's a really good. Uh, you know, uh, I I just think you take it as it comes. Uh, I am surrounded by a really strong team, right? Some really good people uh, that I rely on and lean on. And like many of us, when I have those moments that are really tough, I go to you know my boss Kevin Legrette and go, oh, I just need to talk to somebody. Help. So Legrette's your this. boss. Legrette's my boss. Interesting. Yeah. And, okay, I didn't I didn't know that. Yeah, that's how the chain of code. Yeah, I was so always I, wondering about that. Guy. I report to two people. I have Kevin Legrette, right. who uh, is our market president, yep. and also our division president. So he holds two titles. Mm -hmm. And then I report to Tom Pullman, our chief right. programming officer. Uh, Tom also has oversight on the Los Angeles market. The reason for that is that Los Angeles is such a big and important market oh, yeah. uh, that we have our top people assigned to it. It's very insightful on that. Yep. And you report to Legrette, but Legrette is a good dude. I mean, good he man. knew who I was before I knew his actual name. I knew he was important. He just looks 
like an actor. You know what I mean? He looks, he's always tan. And, yeah, like, it. You know, I'm like, this guy just walks around. He like floats across the station. Yes. Um, but he knew who I was when I got hired here in 2019. Um, yeah, it was 2019. And I remember he was like, hey, sketch. And I'm like, oh my God, I know yeah. that guy's important, but I don't know his name. <laughs> and I had to find out. I pulled a little detective work, but I, I introduced myself to him. And he, yeah, he's a very important guy, but even he has a tremendous amount of stress. Pullman's got a tremendous amount of stress um, because radio and the economy at present state is, I mean, I want to get into that with you, John. But first, let's get back to the stress thing. How do you just, how, what is it? Do you do meditation? Do you play any sports? Do you work out? What is it that you do to, to unwind, to wring out the rag, in other words? Uh, I would say that we need to, for all of our employees, myself included, you need to have a healthy life outside of the list, and what, outside of what we do, and no matter what that is. Right. Uh, you know, for me, it is, you know, working out. I make sure that I'm at the, at the gym on the regular. Uh, on the weekends, you'll find me in the Angeles National Forest hiking. That's sort of my my spot to do some hiking. To the peak? Uh, uh, see, to the peak, yeah. I mean, how many times have you heard that yeah. in your life? It's a terrible. few. Yeah, okay. right? I'm just going to hit the rim shot there for uh, You know, I'm an avid motorcyclist. Uh, that's really? So, uh, yeah, so those things that are just not any way associated with right. this help me. I like to cook. Mm. Uh, and uh, I love music, of course, like so many of us. Um, so that I just have to have those things that are not here right. that can d detach me from this. You know, the motorcyclist thing. Um, what kind of motorcycle do you drive? I have a few. Uh, uh, yeah, you're like Jay Leno of, of motorcycles, right? <laughs> when people ask, "Well, how many motorcycles do you have?" I'm like, "Well, how many pairs of shoes do you have?" Ooh, That's, uh, she. Uh, so uh, I commute on a, a Triumph Street Twin motorcycle. It's a cruiser. Uh, I have so you a, bring it to work. I bring it to work. Yeah, it's what? the best way to and from work. Right? You rock the helmet. Is, Rock the helmet. Is yep. the is the motorcycle kind of like one of those cop looking motorcycles? Uh, I do have trunks. Sort of a, I side? do have a cop looking one with trunks yeah. on the side for for distance when I uh, awesome. because uh, there's nothing more uh, gratifying than hopping on that bike, packing the bags. I mean, how and, American! And then I'm off to you know I'll go to San Francisco. Right. I'll go to Portland. Uh, I've been all across the Western U.S. on that really bike because it's you know I got the helmet on and. Uh, uh, and it's the the best release you can hope for. And, and I remind people here in the Western United States, we have some of the most remarkable parks in the, oh yeah in, in, the Our national park incredible. system is right. is incredible. We take them for granted. We take them for granted, and do. they're they're right here. Yeah, and for free, uh, for by free. the way, free. free. So uh, I love going through our national parks, whether it's Yosemite and, yeah. you know, Olympic National Park in Washington State. So uh, I love going through there and just. Yo, just, I love hiking too, Peak. I want to. I always go up to the Hollywood sign, up to Wisdom Tree. Wisdom I, I Tree's peak, a good hike. Yeah, I go up there because I live. You know, I live across the street yep. from the station, yeah. you know, next to Warner Brothers. Always. That's how dedicated you're. I'm right here, I'm ready gonna, to go. I'm going to schmooze you a little bit just <laughs> to make good. sure you don't want to let me go anytime because I'm a I'm a real team player and I live literally six minutes yeah, on great. foot. From the right station here. in a tiny apartment that's probably, this studio we're in is bigger than my apartment. I just want you to know oh. how dedicated I am. You're in a great location. <laughs> yeah, it's all about location. <laughs> and I pay a arm and that two legs that's for, this, for this place. But By you know the way, what? I'll give it. you some tips. Uh, yeah. Every Sunday I go up and uh, there's some great uh, hikes, uh, you know, both nearby. Yeah. Uh, here in in Burbank, where we're sitting now, there's some great hikes, right. Verdugo, and then uh, up in the Andes National Forest. Now that, thank goodness, uh, things are beginning to melt, yeah, uh, uh, and they're more, the trails are more accessible. There's a lot of great options. That's very good because I've only gone. You know Bob Schmidt, who's yeah. the voice of KLAC. Me and him have been friends for twenty, like twenty years at least by now. And you know, I watched him evolve into the incredible announcer he is. Mm -hmm. He's always had that voice, right? It's great talent. This is KLAC. I can't even do it the way yeah. he does. It's so good. But I'm I'm hoping to get him on the podcast as well. But he took me up to the, like the Burbank hike above where where is like there's like a golf course and like a shooting range over there. It's kind of near past the 5 freeway. Anywho, oh yeah, I went yeah. up, and this is where like the antennas are at. Yes, we hiked all the way. I thought it was gonna buckle, well, I, and he's just he's just no going. Problem. We're just walking, and I'm like, Bob, Bob, slow down. And he's like eighty yards ahead of me, and I lose him, and he's just sitting at the top when waiting. he waiting, and he's just waiting, and he's. Just, I'm like, man, Bob, you're too you're too in shape, man. But I'd love to take a hike with you oh yeah it's a, I it's, would. A, it's a great it's a right? great way to sort of clear your head it is uh, and we are so fortunate that where we live we right. have access to some really terrific hiking it's and great. i always yeah. take like joe rogan's advice on like doing things that are hard yes 
and meaning excruciatingly hard yes. on your bo- physical body to to push through, right? And all you can think about is getting it over with. Yep. And then it makes the rest of life a little easier. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, is that yeah, what, and what I, it does I, for you? I don't know who the stress who said this, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but it like I don't want to leave this life with a perfectly intact body. I want to wear it out. Yeah. I want to wear it out so when I'm done, I have I have exhausted all of it in a really positive way you know and and pushing yourself physically is mm. is one of those things you run marathons i, I don't i no. used to years ago i was a runner but uh after some bad shin yes. splints i gave that up and now Man, I, just, I got runner's knee i'm like a giraffe i can cover a lot of ground quickly john <laughs> but i'm telling you i ran a little bit even when i was walking one of my my right knee meniscus yeah. is that what it is yeah, yeah it starts to hurt and it swelled up and i was walking walking to whole foods That's great. i'm like what the hell <laughs> I'm 45 years old now. It's it does it ch- creeps up on me. It, it just does. reminds me you're not the young man you think you are, yep. even though in your head you still feel of like you're 25. Always. You know? um, John Peake, I, I wanted to get into uh, real quick the the state of radio and what you see the future of radio uh, because with AI evolving. Speaking of evolving in not just careers, but AI is evolving so fast that it's starting to make its way on air. Do you? What do you see for the future of radio, especially here at iHeartMedia? I think we're in a great position right now. As we know, about 90% of Americans listen to radio every day, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're tuned in. And whether they're tuned in on an AMF and radio, whether they're listening on the iHeartRadio app, whether they're streaming at their desk, audio consumption is bigger than it's ever been. So I'm really excited about where things are going now. It, the business is, is evolving rapidly. Things are changing on a dime. Imagine 10 years ago, we couldn't even think about whether people stream in the, in the way they do. But the connection that we have, when you mentioned Big Boy earlier, uh, and you know whether it's Ryan Seacrest or Ellen Kay on Coast or yeah. you know Valentine on my FM, the connection and relationship we've established with our listeners is is remarkable. Uh, you you see it firsthand yeah. when you go to an event and you see our listeners in person and you see them interact with our in, talent in swarms in swarms <laughs> yeah. and and they they approach us times they have a relationship with them they yeah. know them uh, and I look at so I, I know it can be disconcerting. The, how rapidly things are changing yeah. but at the same time it, it's also really exciting it's very exciting also and you see it analytically yeah. you see the numbers right i do and you see, do. you see them all you like you're like neo in the matrix yeah well right? i, I tr- we try to take there's a you know the numbers come from so many different places now yeah. it used to be just one audience measurement now we're looking at multiple audience measurements because people are either listening online or amfm and and we're trying to look at all that and and interpret it and figure out, hey, where are, where are our listeners? How do we serve them best? Yeah. But um, uh, I think so far, like, uh, it, it, it's a positive thing, you know? And with AI, do you think at some point AI is going to take over, like, actual shows? Like, do you see that? Because they're already testing that out. And I tried chat GPT last yes. night for the first time. Uh-huh. I typed in, what should I add, ask my podcast guest? Just as a generic yeah. question. I already knew what I was going to ask you, and it yeah. didn't offer any of the stuff I already asked. Other than... The career stuff but still it wrote it out at lightning speed like it was a real person yes and that kind of is very it's very cool to me because i feel like we're lucky to be in this technological type of revolutionary age where we're seeing space travel you know we're seeing william shatner go to space we're seeing yeah. like the ai thing you know and yes it's scary but at the same time i feel like it's very useful as a tool um, whether or not it's going to be a conscious or takeover radio, I just was curious what your thoughts are. Like, do you feel, do you fear the progress evolving too fast where it's almost, is AI going to push out real jobs? I don't think so, but I'm, I'm not an AI scientist, so I don't really know where it's going to go. Mm-hmm. But I do know that if we're able to take this technology and use it to our advantage, right. uh, just like you did with, you know, putting in your yeah. podcast question into yeah. chat GPT, like, uh, I know it's a tool at this point mm. that we can use to our advantage, whether it's uh, helping us write uh, copy, uh, copy, yeah. correct. Yeah. Right. It's a right copy. Uh, and uh, I think that so many of us are hardwired to believe that that's cheating, right? That we shouldn't be using. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe it's a tool. It's not cheating. Maybe right. it's a tool we can use. And I'm not going to take that text that chat GPT spits out and use it word for word right. but if it prompts me to write something better it's, a, or be it's like a stepping stone yeah that right. that's 
Is that a bad thing? It's no, because look, idea. if you think of cheating, well, then so is like, well, if you ask Siri or Alexa how to get from one place to the next or ways, that's cheating. Well, you, you hey, know? there was a point in time yeah. where, you know, when we first started having navigation tools on our phone, yeah. that people that were that used to traditional maps were like, Thomas hey, Guide. Yeah, Remember you're Thomas Guide. Thomas Guide. Yeah. You're, you're cheating. You need the Thomas Guide. Yeah. Now I dare you to find a Thomas Guide. Oh, right? my God. Or a, or a phone book. Yep. And by the way, I you sort of still have to know where you're going when you're using yeah. Google Maps. Especially Yes. Especially here. Yeah. Don't depend on Waze and Google Maps to yeah. get you from point A to point B quick, as quickly as possible. It just gives you the generic standard way. But if, you know, if you're from, if you're a Los Angelino, which you are now, you've been yes. in the city yeah, long for enough. Sure. But you have the motorcycle. Yes. So you're like street hawk. You're just like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like yep. weaving in and out of traffic. And that's what's cool about LA is you can do that in this city is go between the cars. Do you do you that can, when you, you can ride? do, uh, you can do lane splitting, lane splitting in California is legal. Right. Um, and, uh, it is a, uh, simple, easy way to get around traffic, but also, uh, it gets you out of the lane. There's a couple good things that come from that one. It's safer. Right. Most of the accidents happen when people rear end you. Right. So I don't want to be stopped in a lane and have someone rear end. You ever so, get worried somebody's going to like, yes, always, you know, yeah, the turn left into you is yes, always, always a big veer concern. lanes, yeah. you know what I mean? Or kind of drift off because they're texting their tech. And it's, uh, when you're, you know, because of your visibility on the motorcycle, you can see into vehicles that you past right. and i will tell you that texting is there is a rampant problem because i see it yeah. constantly yeah. As I'm, let me as mention I'm, something yep. i haven't seen yet and i hope this doesn't prompt anybody to do it but i have yet to see a guy on or a gal on a motorcycle texting because oh, yes. you know what because they have to it's with you can't you can't use one hand Correct. i mean i guess you could but, yep. technically but you can't text with the helmet on it's a whole production it is and i haven't yet to see that have you run into any road rage situations on the road, John Peake? Uh, I think that, uh, yes, uh, you do find uh, crazy people out there. And one of the things that uh, you'll learn very quickly when you're riding on two wheels is if it's you versus a uh, vehicle, you're going to lose every time, right? Yeah. Just, so uh, you just learn to brush it off. When <sighs> anything happens, I just move on. I'm not going to argue with anyone. I'm not going to get into a disagreement with them because there's no way to win that. So I just let them be and then clear the area. There's and, no other way to do it. And then you look in the car and if somebody works yes. here, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Yes. Ooh, I yep. always feel like the, the road rage in LA, because you see it's rampant out here. It's, it is. It's like everybody has rabies yes. when they're in their car. I wonder how many of those people, because I don't drink anymore. I'm going on two years, four months, 27 days, right? Good for you. Thank you. I still smoke weed though. Yeah. But like, it's a tool for my mind. But I will say that I always imagine, you know, in retrospect, after not drinking, I, I always think, how many people did I yell at on the road, not while drinking and driving, because I didn't really do that. You know, I, I just would take mm -hmm. an Uber or something. But I will say every now and again, I had a drink and I was behind the wheel. But like, my thing is, how many of those people, whether you're sober or not, and you're behind the wheel and you got into a road rage situation, because you're in your car, you're like, fuck you, go fuck yourself, da 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 da, right? And you're cutting each other off or stepping yep. on the brakes yes. deliberately to try to make yep. them hit you. I wonder how many of those people later on in life or before that road rage or after have seen each other in a bar, met each other, and like, hey, what's up? I'm oh, Scott. Yeah. Oh, what's up? Yeah. I'm John. Hey, let me buy you a drink, yep. right? And then three weeks later, they're road raging because they don't know it's them. I just, I always think about stuff like that. Just, you know, because it, it seems like people act one way behind the row, uh, behind the wheel and another way in I, person. I think you're right. There's something about that when you're in the safety of your own vehicle. Yeah. Suddenly you're really brave and bold. Yeah, yeah. But you have uh, like armor on. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I've done that before. Nah. But yeah, this is why I sold my car, John Peak. I sold Good. my car to, to be able to afford where I live. It's a sacrifice I had to make. I didn't want to sell my car, but I got to be honest. I don't really miss driving anywhere. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I kind of miss the freedom of just jumping in the car and like driving up to like yeah, Carmel, right? You know, where, where I DJ'd a wedding once. It's really, for me, I just feel like people are out of control in Los Angeles. It's crazy. It's wild. It's, it's like crazy. the Wild West. I will say that, you know, owning a vehicle owning a car is sort of hardwired into us as Americans. Absolutely. It, it, it's a symbol of our freedom. You know, you remember when you were 15 and you got your, your learner's permit yeah. and then you got your full permit and you were 16. Like it's all just part of our culture. Yes. Um, and becoming like a man yes. or, you know, or becoming an adult, I adult, should say, just sure. growing into your adulthood, getting a car is like a, a rite of passage. Yeah, it is a rite of passage. That's a good yeah. way to put it. But then, um, uh, when you don't own a vehicle and like you, 
Uh, there was a period of time I didn't own a vehicle. I lived in San Francisco. It was too difficult to have a car in the city. Mm-hmm. So I, like you, sold my vehicle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I was a little hesitant at first as, what, what is that like? Uh, and, and then um, it was so liberating. It was not, it was so wonderful yeah, right. not having that financial pressure of owning a vehicle. Insurance, all that. Insurance, gas, gas maintenance, yeah. and all that. And just, it, it actually turned out to be really liberating. Yeah. So That's if you can make it work, yeah. It's great. Not everyone can because of circumstances, school, I work, that. et cetera. No, I hear Some that. people are tired, but when you can make it work in your lifestyle, it's a, it's pretty good. Thing. No, I'm very fortunate to be able to live where I live. And I took the Burbank bus the other day. I hadn't taken the bur- a bus since I was 16 years old. Or Not maybe, so bad. Maybe like a bus when I worked across the street with Big. Yeah. You know, we had a bus, right? And yeah. That's not, that's a different type of bus. I'm talking about public transportation. I took one to go to the movie theaters to go see John Wick 4. Oh, good. And, I, and it was a dollar. And there was nobody else except the driver. Great. It was fantastic. Because, you know, Burbank, it, every, the whole city shuts down at like 10 o'clock yes. at night, right? That's it what does. I love about living out yeah. in Burbank. It's like a giant movie set. Or you say? And I think that, um, you know, we have in Burbank decent public transportation. Yes. In some American cities, whether it's San Francisco or New York, there's yeah. really... Yes. decent public transportation uh i lived in europe for a few years and, really and really learned to use public transportation more fully there and i'm like this is great it is it is yeah. when you got the hang of it the yes. subway systems that in san francisco the is it the bart system yes the BART. right and because i was going to work in san francisco at wild yeah. 94.9 actually oh yeah one Asian. of ours yes i was and this is back when it was clear channel okay so and you've been with iheart since clear channel i have I've, yes let, let's switch gears a little bit into the the vast illustrious career like as far as, you know, you're starting in the university, right? You get hired at, what is it, the Q... Q107. In, yep. in D.C., DC right? Correct. And that's yep. like your first major market it is. program to write in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. I, at, at Q107, uh, I, was just, I was on air. I oh, was you were on air. Yeah. And what shift did you do, John? Uh, I did uh, weekends, overnights, whatever they I did. I see. So yep. you were like a fill-in utility correct. player. Correct. Right? But did yep. you have your own slot? I did not. No. No. Uh, did you ever get your own show anywhere? Uh, not, uh, well, not at that station. And, mm-hmm. and this, you'll appreciate this, oh, that yeah. uh, I was working at this station q107 and uh i was uh probably like you i was you know doing whatever they called upon me to do i was driving the van uh i was answering phones you know i was uh, what you know i was just doing all the work right and um the whole time i wanted to get on the air and i was bringing tapes to the program directors going hey listen to me on the college station i can do this i can your do demos this. my demos on, on the I'm one bring, cassette tape yeah i'm bringing my cassette. demos and again there and they're giving me some feedback and i'm you know trying and i'm trying and uh uh, uh, one afternoon, this after this didn't happen instant. It was years, like three years later. Um, uh, they come to me and go, "Hey, the the guy that does the traffic reports in the afternoon is sick. Can you do it?" Yes. <laughs> I'm like, That's how I'm, a lot of careers got yeah. started in radio. Somebody didn't show up. That's why you should never take a vacation never when you did. work in radio. Exactly. I'm like, yeah, of course I can do this. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, I uh, what was the time shift again? It was afternoon drive. Nice. Yeah. So uh, prime time. I'd prime time, and jumped in and started doing the afternoon traffic reports. Were you nervous? Uh, of course, I was yeah. so nervous. And then uh, I did my very first report, and the program director at the time, Alan Burns, and the other people in the staff knew that you know being on the air was one of my goals. Right. And uh, because I'd been bringing them tapes and talking to them about, it, I made it clear. And so I did my very first report on the air. And uh, I finished the report, the studio door pops open, and uh, one of the programming assistants is like, the program director wants to see in his office now. And I'm like, what? It's I like when I get called first... into your office. Yeah, I'm like, well, I'm like, get, get down there. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. so I, I go down to the, uh, his, his, do- his door and it's shut and I do that. I'm right. like, oh, oh, he's not there. Uh-huh. And the assistant's like, no, 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 no. He wants you to go right in. No, oh, this is it. I'm getting fired. Like right. I must have done such a terrible job Damn. that I'm getting blown out, right? And so I open the door, uh, and the whole staff is in the room, and they have a bottle of champagne, and they crack the champagne, oh, and they. That's right. You told me yeah, about this. Yeah, they oh do my. a little celebration, Woo! like, "Hey, you did your first uh, live on air report. You didn't mess it up. Congrats. <laughs> Welcome to." They the did team. make you feel like you were gonna you were gonna <laughs> yeah. get fired. Did they oh, kind of totally, give that? Yes, oh yes. my god, that's yeah. so rough right yes, there. Yeah. Have you ever done that to anybody, John? Were you like hired? You were gonna put them on there, but you kind of made them feel like, "Oh, I don't know." Oh yeah, messing around with somebody like that. 
Oh, yeah. The, uh, very recently, you know, we added a new cast member to the Valentine in the Morning Show on My FM. Is it John Camucci? John Camucci. John Camucci in the morning. morning. I have a little impression of him, uh, too. Hey, what's like, up? It's John Camucci in the morning. Hey, it's John Camucci from Valentine in the Morning. He's good, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, no, he's good. He's a pro. He's a pro. He has that radio vibe. But he does a radio be. vibe. And, yeah. you know, he's worked here for several years. He started uh, in our promotions department. Really? Oh, you know? yeah. So he's he's been a street teamer and he's done a lot of different jobs. Yeah. He worked on the Ryan Seacrest team and he's earned his way yes so uh we once we <laughs> know we we're going to add this new cast member we auditioned a number of different people right. uh, valentine was great and bringing different people in and we auditioned him i think three separate times wow and uh after you know considering all of our candidates we decided that he was the best person for the job yeah so, uh, but I told. But he doesn't know that. Yet. He doesn't. Know. So I called Val in and said, "Val, let's let's pull a let's pull a prank on him." So we pulled in my office and we're like, "John, we've given this a lot of thought. I want to thank you for auditioning, um, uh, but you know we're gonna." We're going to go in a different direction. I knew that's the words. We're going to go. That's the dreaded <laughs> words. We're going in a different direction. It doesn't include you. Oh, my God. God. It's just like God. cringing. So and, then. And you then, could see he's like, oh, man. He's like, well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, you know, it was really fun. And maybe the next thing, you know, he said all the right things. Uh, because he's a pro. Right. And then we're like, oh, one more thing. You know, just kidding. Oh, my <laughs> Dude, what, how did he, yeah. what did he respond uh, with? Screamed. Yeah. Screamed, jumped up and down and screamed. And later, Valentine's like, that was really mean. I'm like, oh, come oh, on. Oh, come on. It's great, though. Yeah, I mean, it's great. You talk about like the the the, the pranks and the fun yes. time. I mean, you know, like kind of hazing, kind of hazing, but not in a bad yeah, way. Man, yes. It's just fun hazing. Fun hazing. I mean, I went through my share with it of it with Big oh, at, yeah. at, at, across the street. You know what I mean? This is when, before the hypersensitivity culture really came into play. Mm -hmm. we, this is back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, mm -hmm. when you can got to get away with yep, anything. anything. Yep. I mean, before Janet's breast popped out, yes. that's when the FCC was, it was different. It was, it was a lot. Do you see, speaking of that, do you see like the, since the FCC doesn't control pod, podcasting, right? Correct. Yet. Yeah. But do you ever think that podcasts and podcasting is going to be controlled in any way other like where it is now because we're this is a free form conversation we, we're having i can we can curse you know we can we can go crazy obviously want to keep it in the in the lane yeah in the motorcycle lane <laughs> yeah. but you know do you see at all like any of evolutions of, of podcasting that that could change to a, to a way where it's being controlled I, you know, I don't see that happening only because remember the the airwaves are owned by the public. Right. We don't own them. Terrestrial. Yeah. So uh, that is why the FCC regulates them because yeah. the, the, the people own the airwaves. Yeah. Uh, and it's free. So anyone can listen to it. And that's why we have these rules uh, that regulate content and what yeah. you say and indecency. Can't drop an F-bomb. Can't drop an F-bomb. You can drop an F-bomb uh, though, John. Okay. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll time it out. I'll, I'll sneak one <laughs> I in. want one by the end of this <laughs> podcast, end of it, yes. sir. Yes. 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 Yeah, so, um, but I think, you know, podcasting, because you have to seek that mm. content out uh, and it can come from anywhere. We could, this podcast is originating in, in, in Burbank, California, yeah. but you know, and a podcast could originate in Paris, France, or a podcast could originate in, you know, Rio de Janeiro. Like, so there's really no way yeah. to regulate the content. The only thing the government has taken an interest in up until this point is the FTC, the federal trade commission mm. has said, Hey, you know what? We need to make sure that when you're talking about products and services, that it's truthful, uh -huh. uh, and that's where they take in there. They're, they take in make it's sure more that, in products, yeah, huh? yeah, in that, merch, in merch and products. It's like we want to make sure that and we've had some influencers get in trouble because mm. maybe they've endorsed products they don't use, but they say they do. So that's that's uh, the that's the hook. Is that make would sure be like payola, correct? It's known in radio as payola. payola. They want true. Essentially, it's the old truth in advertising. Like if you're going to be talking about a product and say, "Hey, I'm using this product or service," the uh, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, said you need to make sure that you actually do that right i remember getting that email here about like and the yeah. training course it's yeah. like you got to make sure you tried it or you're using it you or something yeah. you can't just say or you also shot them out you got to credit the person yes. it's a contest and yeah. blah 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 blah. Yeah. i hear you i actually worked with an engineer named john paoli but no relation to paoli oh, yeah. um john peak what about in another and another question entirely different i wanted to ask you and i've asked a lot of my guests Everybody has a great answer, but I'm just wondering, what about you, John Peak? If it didn't fall, if John Peak never fell into radio, right? He never got bitten by the radio bug. You didn't write your content bits for uh, Geronimo, yeah. right, out in, in D.C. Good memory. Thank you. 
Um, what would John Peak be doing career wise? What do you think you'd be into? That's a really good question. Uh, uh, Two times. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I just when I think back of that, but so all of us have that, right? We wonder, like, yeah, uh, the well, al- alternate life. Uh, where would I be? You know, yeah. if, if if these turn events didn't happen this way, if yeah. I didn't happen to get some really good breaks along the way, if people were really generous with their time yeah. along the way, uh, what would I be doing? And uh, yeah, I just don't know. You know, I you just, know. I just don't. I what do you really, think it would be, John? You like, know, what, uh, what other interests? Uh, motorcycles, could, maybe. Maybe you'd be like a yeah, motorcycle yeah, engineer or something. Mo- or, motorcycles are are interesting. You know, uh, uh, I think I'd be terrible at working on them. I don't really, I know how to ride them. I don't really. Oh, know you don't know how to fix them and stuff. Yeah, like no, that. yeah I, it's complicated. It you is have complicated. enough stuff, dude. You're I'm, you're dealing with us adult yeah, children here. It's more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I I was always fascinated with higher education. I could see that. You know. Oh, Professor Peak, Professor Peak. I could, oh, yeah. uh, you know, that would uh, that w- always had a certain interest to me. It certainly it's in my family. My brother is a uh, a teacher back in Maryland, so you know that. I, I guess if I had to say anything, uh, the education. Yeah, education. I could see yeah. you doing that. Yeah. There's this actor who reminds me of you. It's not that you look like him, but you remind me of him, or he reminds me of you. His name, I think his name is Jonathan Campbell. Do you don't know, know him? Is? No, gotta you, look him up. You don't know Jonathan Campbell? No. Let me pull him up real quick, just for. For the folks, yes. <laughs> well, for you actually, because um, every time I see him or I, I see you, I always go, "Man, he Jonathan Campbell." Wait, is it Campbell? No, it's not Jonathan Campbell. John nothing. I'm, I looked up John Campbell. Hold on here. It's Jonathan. I think. Is this him? Is he an absolutely no. hideous no, man? No, he looks like he looks like he could be related to you. I okay, think I'm I'll messing up his name though. Oh no, it's Campbell something. That's his first name. I gotta find this guy. Hold on, real uh, quick. We can. Oh, there it is. Campbell Scott. Campbell Scott. Yeah, have okay. you seen him? This guy. He totally looks like like he's related to you somehow for some reason. Oh, I can see that. Right? Yes. Yeah. That's, yep. So Campbell, Campbell Scott. Scott. I don't know why I said Jonathan Campbell. Yep. I, I think because think your name's it. John. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you could be like John Campbell. Yep. That would be you. <laughs> um, John Peak. Man, you've, you've answered so many of my inside questions I wanted to ask you. I, I'm sure you're in a bit of a rush to get out of here or you're just completely bored, but I want to make sure that we cover all the bases. I don't want to, I don't want to just rush just for the, cause yes, you're the VP and you know, you're the boss and I, but I don't want to just completely go, okay, that's good enough, John. I, I want to keep going until you've I got had it. enough. You tell me. I have so much more to get to. Uh, you said you lived in England for a while, right? No, oh, I, no. I, I, I lived in I lived in Paris for two Paris. years. Yeah, Paris. Do you speak French? Uh, yeah, un peu. Yeah, 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 a bit. Yeah, right. uh, uh, I wouldn't call myself fluent. Right. Uh, I would say that I speak restaurant French. Okay. You know, uh, which is just enough. Just enough. Right. Uh, when I go back for visits, and I I go back at least once a year. Yeah. Uh, it comes back to me. You know. Do you ride uh, motorcycles in Paris? Uh, I uh, or bikes. <laughs> uh, my entire time in Paris, I got around on a little green Vespa. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> with, a, with a baguette. Yeah. Come in. You, you, yes. grow, you grow your handlebar. Yeah, handlebars and, and smoke. Oui, oui. Yeah. <laughs> John the Pete. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You smoke. Yeah. Um, I went to uh, Europe to go work for um, a European uh, radio company called NRJ. Energy. Energy, NRJ. yes. Yeah. I did imaging for yeah, that. Yeah, NRJ. So uh, I uh, did that for two years based in, in Paris and worked uh, both with the French team and uh, um, the other markets as well. We had uh, networks or stations in eight Western European countries. Mm-hmm. So I spent time in you know Norway, Finland, uh, Germany, uh, Belgium, uh, and working with those different teams that really helped me uh, with overall strategy, you know, mm-hmm. as far as uh, how we put together our playlists and how we interact and morning show content and you know the uh, all of it. Can you talk a little bit in detail of how you collaborate these or or uh, how you program the playlists, even here at iHeartMedia? Can you give us an inside look at how it walk me through like what it takes? Is it the analytics? Is it which song is being pushed on the media acts, all access sites. Like how do you figure out which are like the top 20 songs uh, like on my FM, for example, first of all, there's, you know, we get the new releases that come to us on the regular, whether Miley Cyrus has a new release or Harry Styles or Taylor Swift. Mm-hmm. So as these artists are releasing new music, uh, typically the, the, the strategy at the label side is, as you know, you release a single, right? right? One song right. at a time. And then, uh, my job is to listen to all the songs that come our way, that the ones that seem appropriate, uh, particularly from IFM, the station I program day to day. And uh, we try to pick the songs we think the audience are going to like the best. If you play 
The best, most appealing songs, that translates into more listeners, more listeners translate into ratings, and that's ultimately what we're here to do, to get the biggest ratings we possibly can. Uh, once we get those songs on the air, then we have a lot of analytics to, to look at, whether that's streaming data, we do a lot of audience research, where we ask people, if you like this song, we played it too much, too little, you're tired of hearing it. Mm. And then all of that is factored into how frequently you hear those songs on the radio. Uh, our only objective here is to, I want to play the songs people want to hear, mm -hmm. right? That's it. Uh, and I want to play them in a frequency that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we do reasonably well with it, yeah. uh, here, but it's, uh, you know, the, the art of it is when we sit in our meetings, we're just listening to music and go, does really? this make sense? And does this make sense? Well, will my audience like this? Do you get tired of the music at all? Like having to just like be the, the, the guy who sorts through all the new stuff, even though new music is great. Cause I make music imaging yeah. sweeps or music imagers, they call them for chase cuts, which kiss FM uses, right? Mm -hmm which is ran by Eric Chase, but I'll just go on all access, all access media site, look at the ones that are up charting. Yep. And it, I'll look down, see if you, anything Taylor Swift, it immediately goes in. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Miley Cyrus, go, it could be number a hundred. It's still going in cause it's going to be up charting within a couple of weeks. Right. Yes. But it's a lot of work for me. I mean, I work three different part-time jobs. You are a program director and a VP. Right. You know what I mean? You're, you're managing all this talent. Um, you're managing me and Tony, yep. you know what I mean? Yeah. You're managing the program directors. It's it's like a, a carousel of obligation and responsibility. And then you have to listen to all this music. Is there any part of either jobs that kind of you're just worn out by? Or do you have to keep reinventing yourself, sort of? I think that uh, maintaining your passion and interest in it uh, right. re really helps. This has never worked. There's some days it feels like a job, but most days it's still really it's fun. It's fun, right? right? It's fun, and you have to remember what makes it fun, and you have to you have to hold on hold on to that. And I know I I show up here every day with the attitude of hey, you know what? I have to I have to earn my place. Yeah. I don't take it for granted ever ever. I got to earn my spot every day and put as much effort into it as I can. And I look at that like hey. If I'm doing the best job that I can in, in helping the company succeed, uh, then I'm also uh, doing the best I can by all of our employees. I have an obligation and responsibility to everyone that works here to do the best job I can because your livelihood depends on my doing right. a good job. Right. So I never take that for granted that uh, that I have a responsibility to the crew that works here to the best that I can. Yeah. So that that's a piece of it. As far as the music goes, we have great relationships yeah. with our label partners, yeah. our music label partners and our managers. And uh, they bring music to us. And I know what's important to their side. Hey, this this Taylor Swift track, is a, they'll bring it to me. This is our next priority. Be sure you spend time with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll often get music in advance. Hey, this is not released yet. I need you to spend time with it. So um, like our listeners, the best way for me to measure that is just spend time with it. I like listening to music. I listen to a lot of music. Yeah. I spend time with it, listening to it repeatedly. And open format, too, because you have to listen to a lot of different music, of music right? Yeah. We're fortunate. We have a great team of program directors, Lisa Warden, who programs Alt 98.7. Right. Shout out to Warden. Yeah, she knows that alternative music inside now. Oh, yeah. You know, we rely on her to pick the songs that are right for Alt 98.7. Jill Kempton is the program director for Coast. For Coast yeah. and Jill knows the uh, I still haven't met her in person yeah, She's yet. great. I don't know. Maybe I did. I just feel like all you program director and v the VP and they're very mysterious. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, you're very mysterious it's, like managing. It's like because we never I, I just don't go looking. I try to stay out of everybody's way. I always feel like I'm ruining somebody's day, even if they see me in the hallway and they're like, oh. I'm scared. No, never. You know, I know, but you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm very insecure sometimes mm -hmm. and I don't want to, I don't want to push or step on anybody's toes, but sometimes I got to let it be known yes, of course. and go over there. And it's, it's just wild. Cause I don't really know. I don't know Beata that well. She just knows me for my time card and she's technically my manager she is. on the time card. Right. Yep, but she is. I remember one time I, I sent it in late and I had to walk, I walked her off. I was like, well, sorry, Beata. She's like, Oh, it's okay. Yep. She already knew. She knew, but I don't really converse. I don't have a communicative relationship like I have with you, John. Yep. And that's okay. I, I'm not trying to be everybody's friend. I just want to get the job done so that, like you said, at the end of the day, when everybody, hit, their head hits the pillow, it's all a win-win-win situation. Everybody wins. And I know that uh, every uh, Friday after close of business, I'm looking for the email from you yeah. telling me <laughs> telling me that our clear. audio is yeah. loaded yeah, yeah. and have a good weekend. I'm like, yeah, whew, that's yeah. good. Right? It's always, and you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that you asked me to do that because it opened up this, this relationship yeah. between us. Uh, yeah. And I know... It's an employer-employee uh, relationship, but I do admire your 
I do admire you, John, for your patience. That's one thing that I really noticed first and foremost. Even Andrew, he was very patient too. He but, was. You know, he was very fast. He was always on the move. Yes. You could. He would come in and sit down and then stand up in sixty and walk out. <laughs> you, you, you know, you're a little bit more. Well, you're chill. You're just like you. Yeah. You're relaxed, and I don't know how you do that, especially under the tremendous stress that this place gives you and me. Yes. But even more so you, because you're the VP. I'm in production. I deal with my own level of, of crosses to bear. <laughs> and you've seen it. You were there. Oh, I, yeah. I, yeah. You're like, oh, sketch, you know, you just got to take it easy. Relax. <laughs> just relax. Yeah. It's just, I remember you're all sketch. It's just business. Just remember that. And, and next time you feel a certain way, don't respond to them. Call me. Yes. And I was like, really? <laughs> I remember I told Tony Sanchez and he was like, well, that means you're in the car. I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. What car is that? I don't know. Whatever car that peaks driving, you're in, there. <laughs> you're in there. Yeah, I was. I felt very fortunate to have that open communicative, uh, establish that communicative relationship with it's you. It's been good. Yeah. And I, I try and since then, because you did that, the morale that it gives me, it, it gives me a sense of like, at least he cares because a lot of times. And this isn't just here at iHeart. I'm talking about across every entertainment media industry, even in personal lives. People don't reply. Yes. And, and that's something that really bothers me. And I want to ask you real quick, not just about replying, but the complacency that, that happens. Again, not just here. Yeah. I, can, I can single out people. I'm not going to do that. It's not okay, about good. this. That's good. not what this good. podcast is about, of course, because they're not here to defend themselves either. Yep. I'm sure they have their own crosses. Beer, and I understand that. When you're in LA, like we've talked about, the top we're at the top of the food chain when it comes to here in New York, right? When it comes to complacency, do you see complacency around you? And does it make you angry? Because I see you here on Fridays at the end of the day. Yeah. You're here all day long. Yeah. When I come in, you're still in your office. Yeah. And I'm like, man, Peak's still here. And you get that, like you said, you get the email from me, the all clear, yeah. me and Tony, and we're all good, right? And you go, Whew. but how do you deal with lackadaisical complacency when people like become like kind of like divas you know what i mean because you got a lot of those again not just here everywhere right. but how would you deal with the, like the i'm on my own island kind of mentality from from an employee whether they're on the air or not how do you deal with that uh, i think uh, there's first a couple things like we're in los angeles we play at a really high level here yeah. right that that's just the expectation of a par of, for the course par for the course that that's what happens here so uh, those people that are complacent or not hard working they get washed out you know they they it just it just is you know that happens and and they don't they don't make the cut either, usually by you know by their own complacency right that's that that's what happens so typically they do themselves in because they it wasn't meant for them and by this is not for everyone this is not for everyone yeah, you for know sure. some people don't want to work at this pace or don't like this pressure. It's cutthroat. It's cutthroat. And there are other places where they're better suited. Right. So that's not a bad thing. There may be some places that are a better fit. So that, you know. that's such a, it's such a, not, I don't want to say corporate, but the right way of corporate response. Like, <laughs> like you, it's very in the middle. Like the way you said, it's almost like what the Netflix head of Netflix said when the whole Chappelle thing was happening. Yep. Right. He was like, perhaps our content breadth, mm -hmm. right? That's the right word. Yeah, yeah isn't suited for you yeah. and he was saying that to his employees that, yes. that were having beef with him or beef yep. with the whole situation right. which i thought was like to fight back like that to, to kind of hold your ground but to say it so eloquently now me you seen me i'm like ah what the fuck john <laughs> you know what i mean like I, you don't understand I, I i did that music bed 18 times and they're still not happy and you're like sketch it's okay just do it again but but this time just let them know that that this, you, you give me the right thing to say. Yep. Same thing with Tony. I mean, this guy's like Obi Wan Kenobi patient. It's amazing, isn't it? How? Yeah, he's I'm lose. I'm if I had any hair left on my bald head, I'd be <laughs> ripping it out by the fist <laughs> loads. Funny. And I don't understand how you and Tony and, and other people that are powers, you know, management and uppers, are able to just stay at level like i've never seen you angry and i don't want to but do you yeah. ever get angry oh of course there's moments where it's really uh frustrating yeah. there's things that uh just fluster or frustrate make you upset and, right. and uh i try to follow the advice that i give you right yeah. just walk away take yeah. take a breath uh uh if i find myself uh sending an email that maybe i have second thoughts about i put it in my drafts and if it's good to send the next day i will and 
10 out of 10 times it's not by the way uh so <laughs> have you ever had to curse somebody out uh i don't think i've ever had to, i've had tough words with people before um uh, but i don't think I ever cursed cursed anyone out I, I i don't understand uh when people are really cruel or mean to others particularly people they work with mm. uh I, I that doesn't register to me i can't treat people that are close to me or or you know in my orbit like that that just right. i'm not wired that way uh but you know i'll get frustrated yeah. i'm sure we've had disagreements and arguments of course you know but uh i don't think for me I ever reach that sort of level you've never of, popped off you've never blown a gasket blown a gasket no it's not Man, uh, i gotta learn i have a lot to learn from you yeah, john really i do yeah. uh, you know what it is i think it's also the way i was raised because i'm i'm from mexico city my mom and dad argued a lot in yeah. spanish yeah and my mom and dad would argue kind of like to the point where it was normal yeah. You know, like it just didn't. And this is I was a kid in the 80s, a teenager in the 90s. My 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 dad took off when I was 16. I know that there's a lot of deep psychological issues that require tissues mm -hmm. in my brain. And yeah. I have yet to get therapy for it, although I do want it. OK, good. You know, at some point, it's just finding the time and I don't want to do it online. I yeah. want to go. I got to be in front of this like I'm in front. This is therapeutic yeah. to me. It makes sense. You know, course, just yep. having you in front of me is different from being. I get it. A lot of stuff is done like that now, especially since COVID. But it's enough already. By the way, yeah. we're in Los Angeles, yeah. which is ground central for all the therapists. <laughs> There's a lot of great ones here, yeah. Yeah. so uh, take advantage of we're in a spot where they're all here. If you have any good suggestions, I got I still have your email pinned to the top of my email about the uh, what is it, about offer it offers free therapy uh, for e IR? E EAP. We have EAP. an employee like many large companies. We have an employee assistance program, yes. uh, which uh, helps you know for uh, people that just want like uh, whether they need therapy, they want to talk about their finances, something to help guide them with budgeting, all those things that you know happen in life mm -hmm. and uh, we provide that as a service to our employees and it's a it's a very I'm, I'm proud to say that we do it and i know uh i have worked with employees that have called it and and came back from me later and said thou oh, wow that really helped me at this yeah, time it's like getting underneath the hood of your own mind yeah i could see uh, speak, speaking of just the whole well going back to the whole uh, alternative career move right in an alternate universe you being a professor or i could see you being a therapist because yeah. you're so good <laughs> right. at listening and just kind of going, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, working in this building, you know, yeah. with all these uh, different personalities, uh, you learn to to listen and hear them out. How long have you been at iHeart? Uh, about 14 years. 14 years. And you mm -hmm. were since Clear Channel, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. And you started in Seattle? What uh, was I, I've worked in Phoenix. Phoenix. Uh, and Seattle and San Diego and now Los Angeles, all with iHeart. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 2000, like 2008 or nine was when I started. Yeah, 2009, I think, yeah. In regards to getting hired, for people that want to get into radio, right? Like I have a young friend. I don't know if he's that young. Let's just say I have a friend. Mm -hmm. His name's Chuck, the old soul, uh -huh. right? <laughs> Chuck, the old soul, has been trying to, has been wanting to get, he's worked at CBS. You know, he's done, he's done his share. He's a professional DJ. He's very good with the technical stuff, has a deep, vast knowledge of music. And hip hop, and you know, he's one of those utility guys. Yeah. And I'm trying to get him hired on Big Boy Show, right? Mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't put too much of this out there because it's still in the works. So okay. I'll probably edit a little bit <laughs> yeah. of it out. But Chuck the Old Soul wants to get in. How, what would you advise people uh, to get into radio? Like, do you think they should go to school for it? How would you suggest to somebody like a Zillennial or even somebody a little older outside, like the Millennial or whatever Lennial you are? to get into radio who's had no experience in radio at all and they all want to I want to get in what do you suggest how do they do it John P uh, that's a really good question uh, another one right yeah, so three times. Uh, I will say that look uh, uh, finding those opportunities those entry level positions is tough right yeah. um, there were more like in so many industries there were more jobs before but there still are jobs right that's the way I look at it um, here, um, we have these part-time producers. They sit right outside the studio we are yeah. right now. Like Jessica Rayban and Roger Rodriguez Roger. And, and Aaron Story. And and, uh, and these young people are, are, are superstars, yeah. right? I, I see the uh, attention to detail they have. I see their work ethic. I see their output. And it's it's impressive. So, uh, and, and many of those people we've heard are, are leveraging these jobs into bigger jobs within the company. So part of it is just... You know, knowing those jobs are out there. Uh, there's plenty of resources to find jobs. Uh, uh, 
it's so much easier than when you and I started yeah. you know, calling radio stations, asking them they job. Now you just go online, you can see all the jobs that are out. So there's more resources to find the job right. than there ever were. I think that, that's that's part of it. Having relationships or at least knowing people at these companies yeah. matters. So you can you you can call Sketch and go, hey, what do you know that's out there? Like, yeah, you're gonna, please don't call me, guys, because I don't want to yeah. get try to get anybody hired. I don't have that kind of pull here. I I literally had got chuck just a phone call that's yep. that's all i can do i can only show you the door it's yep. up to you to make your choice to walk through it and get prepared because when you do get hired here the work comes hard and fast, fast. af yes am i right about yeah, that John and you Peter? gotta you gotta be ready for it yeah. and then once you get in the door um then you gotta you know work for it yeah right? and you yeah. got that's when the real work begins that's when the real work you began. thought it was hard just to get in here getting the job was easy. once you're yeah once you get in that past that interview and you get hired you got to be ready like you've never been ready before i don't care what department you work in yep. it doesn't matter if you're programming sales what's what other uh, engineering you have it doesn't to have, matter you have to have the hustle promotions for sure or, you yep. got to be ready i if you got to have an iv of red bull being pumped straight into your veins but you know earlier we were talking about one of the hosts on the valentine show oh, yeah. john camucci there's a great example of uh, a young man that uh, started here uh, you know as a street teamer right hey it's john camucci from valentine in the morning really worked hard was dedicated to it uh was at all of our big events whether the iheart radio music festival wango tango you name it he yeah. was at the iheart theater um you you know, he was escorting artists around. Uh, he did whatever was called upon him to do. And uh, then when the Ryan Seacrest team was looking for somebody to join that team to help out, you know, he, we knew his work ethic. He'd already proven himself. He got that opportunity. Did he go for it or did you kind of tap him for it? I, I think, you know, I wasn't even part of that decision at the uh, time, so I don't want to speak for right. them, but uh, I know he earned his way there. Yeah, he I earned can, his way. And I'm I sure he did that. want it. I'm yeah. sure he did. Obviously, you wouldn't be doing all yeah. the different player positions if you didn't want to get something. Like me, at some point, I would love to get full time, John, and yep. I'm not going to lie. Tony Sanchez has told me this, so I'm just going to relay it. I would be remiss. Two things I'd be remiss, and then we'll wrap this up, John, because okay. I know you got things to do, and I do want to thank you for taking this time my pleasure. to be on my my little podcast. But this this is a big deal, and I think I'm, I'm going to call it quits after this, John P., because I've reached the point. Right, you're done. Yeah, right? But I would be remiss if I didn't relay what probably a few other people have told me. Why aren't you on the air sketch, right? And I've told them I have no agenda to be on the air. Mm -hmm. I like doing my podcast. I like the free form. I would say I'm very content in the position that I have in Great. production. And I know that there's longevity in my production, but I've been doing it since I was 18 years old. I've been in radio since I was 16, but I've been doing this, you know, working with big for 23, 24 years now. The production is, it's made me my money. It's made me who I am. Define me as far as a producer, right? Mm -hmm. But to be on the air is a whole different game. And yeah, I've thought about it. But I'm also thinking like, well, if I were to want to be on the air, not in L.A., but to do like voiceover, like voice tracking, like in other markets, like Nebraska yeah. or something overnight, do you think that would be something that I'd be capable of? First of all, I've, I've never heard you on the air. Right. It's a tough thing, but right. we have those opportunities in the company. Uh, the challenge would be that, hey, there's a lot of really good people in the company that also want that yeah, work. Yeah. Uh, not that the opportunity is not there. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would you like know. to try to give that a shot at least. I at think some that point. I think that I learned early on. Yeah. Um, well, I've been on the air before. Yeah. I was on the air at Groove Radio when okay, I was so 19 you know. years old. So I know, you know how to be on the air. I mean, you can't say that I don't have the voice yes. for television and the face for radio. Yes. Right. <laughs> it's it's very apropos. If you can hear me in the headphones and how this podcast is going to sound after once it's fully oh no with compressed and produced. You'll know. It'll be like my demo to you, John. Oh, Peek, perfect. I love right? it. And then you could throw me on in the middle of the night in, uh, you know, North Carolina right. or something. I don't know. Something wild. I would love to try it at least. It is fun. And I learned early on uh, yeah. uh, being on the air in multiple places that uh, being on the radio is really enjoyable. It's fun. It's, it's fun. really fun. I also learned early on. Uh, there's people that are really good at it and, yeah. much, and much better than me. Uh, and uh, if there's one takeaway from... Having that experience of doing it is, uh, whether it's Big Boy or Valentine or JoJo or EJ on yeah. Kiss, we EJ have a long killer. list. He's a, he's a um, killer. That I really have a tremendous amount of admiration Me and too. respect for yeah. the skill that goes into that. These these guys are talented. Yeah. They're really really good at it. They may, and when they make it look easy, I know how good they are. Exactly. They make it look seamless, and everybody yeah. wants to do it. I just kind of want to, you know, show what I can do. My versatility yep. as a utility player, just like you were, John yep, Peake. I sure. mean, I'm not. 
I, this is what Tony said. He goes, Sketch, your talents are being wasted in production. Those are verbatim his words. And I go, yes, maybe to a degree, but honestly, I'm very content because I know I'm, I'm tied directly into what this company needs in order to make yep. the revenue, right? Yep. Which means product, commercial yep. production. It's a good job. I'm an imaging guy. I'm a production guy. I'm, I could be a, produ- a show producer. I could be on the air. But see, a lot of the other latter things haven't really been known about yep. me because I came in here as a production I guy. I think I know that you know what I'm talking about. I do. Right? Yep. So consider this kind of like my little demo to you, okay. John Peak, right? <laughs> we'll do. You want to throw me on. And then next, just to wrap this up, last but not least, John, and I would be remiss, all capitals, if I didn't ask, is it possible, and I could always edit this out if you want to say no, and we could just end it. But is it possible now that we've had this interaction, yes. this great con, this amazing, compelling conversation about radio and career and whatnot? Is it possible that I tried this before to collab with you on Instagram to promote this podcast? Yes. And in order to do it, I have to follow you and you have to follow me back Done. because for a while you wouldn't accept my request. And I felt like <laughs> I made you feel a certain, like I was forcing you and I don't want to force you because I don't. But I was also hacked and suspended off Instagram. Oh. I had to create a new one. And I think you followed my old account and then it got hacked and suspended, yeah. John Peake. And I was trying to get well, you back. Send me a new one. Yeah. Can I do it now? Yes. Can we do it live Let's on the podcast? Let's do it live. Oh right my now. God. I'm so excited. I was so nervous to ask you this, John Peake, because I, you know, I hate asking people to follow me, but this is to promote <laughs> you, John, and it's to promote our podcast. Let's see. Right, I'm ready. There you are. Here we go. Here we go. I'm refollowing because I canceled the request. I didn't want you to sit there and have to debate on it. Okay, there it is. Sketch underscore Omatic for anybody who wants to follow me on IG at Sketch underscore Omatic. All right, I'll let you know when it comes in. It's there. Yeah, refresh. Oh, just refresh it. Refresh. You might it. have to go to your request box. Uh, that's another reason that it's uh, hard to see go. if you go to like your request box on the far right. Uh, hold on it, here. So should, you know this better than I do. Yeah. Oh, uh, request. Okay. Here we go. No hidden requests. Hold on. You're not there yet. Really? Did you block me? I may have blocked you. <laughs> I blocked you out. Oh my God, I got blocked by John. I got a bunch of Russians that want to follow me, but I don't see you in there. Yeah, can you search for me? Yeah. You got a bunch of Russians trying to <laughs> <laughs> Well, you didn't do it with malice block. No, I didn't. Or was I just annoying the shit out of you to no, do no, it? No, 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 no. Oh, we still got to get an F-bomb from John Peake. <laughs> oh, here you go. This, that's not you, is it? Yeah, that's it. Done. Yeah? Following you. Oh my God, John Peake <laughs> just followed me back on IG. Now I have to really be on my best you behavior totally. on IG. I don't want dad to find out. All right, I'm following you. Oh my God, I'm refreshing. There it is. No! Oh my God. For yeah. another Sketch O Show podcast. World Thank premiere. you. This was fun. I appreciate the time. And then he unfollowed me right after. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> John Peake, thank you so much for taking the time out of your immensely busy schedule. This was fun. Thank you. It was really fun. I hope at one point after, you know, some time passes and we've lived more life and more stories to tell, you can come back. Hopefully, I'd love to. I, I'm still going to keep going because you've now given me this morality boost morality is it morale? morale 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 boost Let's go. to want to keep going don't come to you from morality yeah morality <laughs> <laughs> way off john peak ladies and gentlemen thank VP you my friend of iheart media los angeles oh good for you and how was it the sketchomatic show hey, too much information this shit man shut your mouth essay <laughs> Okay, bye. My entire time in Paris, I got around on a little green Vespa. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> with, a, with a baguette. Yeah. I come in. You, you, yes. you grow your handlebar. Yeah, handlebars and smoke. Oui, oui. Yeah. Jean-Louis. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You smoke. Yeah.